Hello and welcome to an introduction to eBPF. eBPF is not a very beginner friendly topic and requires you to have at least some basic knowledge of the Linux kernel, especially um, kernel space, user space, ring zero or ring three and kernel hooks. But we'll go through them in the next slides. So I'll try to explain user space, kernel space, ring zero and ring three as quickly as I can. But if you are not aware of this, I have already posted links um, for your reference. So what is user space and what is kernel space? Kernel space uh, is literally the place where your kernel resides. It's a place in the RAM, it's the memory block where the kernel resides. What is in the kernel? You have drivers to drive your hardware, you have the scheduler to schedule your applications, you have kernel functions, memory mapper to map your memory, uh, etc, etc, even network functions. So even if you do a data transfer and you are aware of the OSI model, up until layer four is the one that is uh, being done in the kernel and then your application takes over. So how do these two communicate? Applications make a system call to a kernel function. The kernel function runs and does what it was told to. It might talk to the driver, it might talk to the scheduler, the memory mapper or the network function as need be. This is how it works. Now, one of the important things to note here is ring zero and ring three or as known as user mode and supervisor mode in the ARM systems. Ring zero is essentially the mode of CPU where all of the CPU's functions are accessible to the code that is running there. Ring three by uh, contrast is the least amount of CPU functions that are extend, uh, that are available to the application running in ring three. Most of your user space applications run in ring three while the kernel runs in ring zero. Ring zero allows you to have access to quite a few extra CPU functionalities like the memory mapper, the hardware uh, page tables, etc. But uh, we won't get into the depths of that. All right, uh, another uh, thing that you need to know is what are kernel hooks. So when your application makes the system call, uh, let's assume we take a kernel function and this function is something like this. It's a simple function, but kernel hooks are essentially a small function here somewhere at the top of this, which calls this function. And you can essentially change uh, or hook a program such that you uh, such that you put this kernel function and it calls this new function that you set up or some other function. And then that calls the old function. And this is what we are trying to do today. So now let's know what eBPF is. eBPF is a kernel extension that was introduced in Linux kernel 3.14 and has been growing ever since. What eBPF is, is a virtual machine inside the kernel. It's a very, very tiny virtual machine with a very low overhead and it resides in the kernel. Now eBPF is also a compile time target for LLVM. So your um, normal programs like C, C++, Go, Rust, etc. technically can be combined, sorry, compiled into the eBPF virtual machine target. I say technically and not actually because as of now only Rust and C are supported because of the limitation of the fact that you are trying to run arbitrary code in the kernel. So what eBPF does is it utilizes a subset of C or Rust and allows you to write some code that uh, passes some guarantees that are specified by the Linux kernel. For example, you cannot have a loop that might or might not end. You have to have a specific finite loop. It has to have a condition which is guaranteed to be triggered and end the loop. There are, uh, you cannot have arbitrary pointers pointing anywhere and there are a lot of other caveats. But that those uh, limitations are actually beneficial because otherwise uh, instead of just providing extension, it would also introduce um, a lot of vulnerabilities in the kernel. You do not want somebody with kernel privileges to be able to execute any code in ring zero as we discussed before. And the third thing is the Linux kernel also has a verifier. So once you load a eBPF program, the verifier first verifies it, traverses through almost all of the um, possible branches, etc., to determine 
whether this code is malicious or not and only if the verifier passes the check is the program loaded into the kernel. Now eBPF uses kernel hook points for code execution. So as you see on the right side, uh, this image is being taken from the eBPF.io official website. eBPF can be attached towards the boundary of the user space and kernel space here at the system call level. Uh, it can be put in any of the hooks that are present in the center that is the place where you have kernel functions being executed or it can be attached at the bottom where the kernel interfaces with the physical hardware that is the last function. So for storage for networks you can even for networks eBPF is here on the NIC if you have a smart NIC or any device that supports eBPF you can also have eBPF there. One interesting thing is eBPF here in the process. Now eBPF is a kernel feature but that kernel introduced the uh, feature called uprobes. Uprobes are user level probes where you can essentially hook to one particular function inside a user process and eBPF can leverage that to do user function level tracing or anything that you want to do at that level. Alright, so let's quickly go through the few use cases of eBPF. The primary one being uh, quick development of drivers and patching drivers and vulnerabilities. So in an idea, in a normal scenario, uh, if you have a patch for a driver or a new driver, then you develop a new driver, then you push it upstream to the Linux kernel. The kernel maintainers might accept it, might reject it depending on your code. Uh, eventually when they accept it, then uh, every distrib distribution, etc., and every user have to fetch it and uh, build it. Or once it's in the official build, then it gets sent downstream to the rest of the users. That is a long process. With eBPF, now you can develop the patches and uh, additions to the drivers much more quickly and then just send them off to your users directly without going through the upstream Linux kernel. And you do not have to wait for that. eBPF originally stood for extended Berkeley packet filter. Berkeley packet filter eBPF was developed for packet filtering and extended eBPF uh, was introduced so that it was easier to develop uh, BPF-like programs in C-like languages. As we said, uh, eBPF uses a subset of C. Um, but at this point, it is more known as eBPF and less as the full form of it because the full form makes you think of packet filtering and that is not what eBPF is right now. It is much, much more than that. Uh, but as we discussed earlier, uh, Linux kernel depacketizes your packets up until L4. So if you want to do L2 or L3 filtering, it is much more easier to do it inside the kernel and eBPF or even the older BPF would allow you to do the same. You also have IP tables, etc. for this, but eBPF is supposed to be faster than Linux IP tables. Uh, another feature that uh, system call uh, that eBPF has is system call tracing or filtering. There are quite a few application and ecosystems out there like file, Sysdix Falco uh, that allow you to make system call level tracing. So you can have Falco running in eBPF mode. Falco has its own driver and also has an eBPF option. And what it allows you is that per application or per container, uh, if you are using Docker based uh, system call tracing. And with the advent of the Linux security module hooks, which is a very recent addition in eBPF, you can also trigger uh, LSM modules from eBPF or have LSM modules trigger eBPF code, vice versa. And this is very useful if you want to block system level, uh, you want to block system calls at the kernel level. The system call tracing also expands to observing file accesses, monitoring managing or managing IO resources, etc. And as we already discussed, uh, uprobes allow you to trace user level programs also. That is, you can trace user level functions using eBPF. Although at this stage, uh, GDB and other such programs also exist and can compete with eBPF. All right. Let us now consider how you can trace system calls inside Linux using different features provided by Linux itself. So what are system calls? 
you have an application, you want to access a kernel function, which might be um, accessing a file, getting uh, some extra memory and maps, or maybe accessing network, etc. All of this is uh, provided by the kernel and your application makes a system call to that kernel function, which provides you with this particular facility. So how do you trace system calls? There are multiple ways to trace them. Uh, Linux already had ptrace. Um, you can also use a custom implementation of libc just like glibc or musl etc. Or you can use ebpf. So let us see how each of these work. What is ptrace? ptrace is a system call that allows the, an application to trace some other application system calls. ptrace system calls instructs the kernel to hook into a specific application and trace its system calls. Let's see the next, so how it works. So you have an application that tries to make a system call. Here's the kernel hook. The hook intercepts it and sends the trace features back to the program that requested the trace. And then uh, after the trace is done and some instructions, if need be, are relayed back. Uh, those are relayed back to the kernel and then the kernel function may or may not execute depending on what the instruction was. Uh, one of the benefits of this is this so ptrace has been existing since a long time and uh, programs like strace already exist uh, in the ecosystem uh, ubuntu already provides this uh, strace of course has limited by the fact that you need to either be a root user or the user that is running this application without which uh, you cannot randomly access any application system calls all right uh, but one of the major limitations of this application of uh, ptrace sorry is that uh, you have a lot of context switches between the kernel space and the user space as you see here. All right. Uh, another option is libc. So what is libc? libc is the library that is provided uh, in Ubuntu, it's glibc. There are other windows as its own version of libc. There's musl, etc, etc. Uh, each of these are libraries that essentially allow an application to make a system call. So if you write a generic C application and you want to do a file access, you will be using libc. It's not limited to C, even uh, Python's Java, C++, etc. would be using libc. So what you can essentially do is these libc, you can, you can take up a particular variant of libc, let's say glibc, and you can overwrite glibc and introduce a tracing feature in each of the functions that are provided by libc. It's a tedious task, but it can be done. eBPF. So what is eBPF? eBPF is very similar in this case to how ptrace worked, except that instead of the jumping between the user space and kernel space, eBPF stays in the kernel space and avoids the context switches. But otherwise, it literally does the same thing of hooking up to the system call, then uh, running some arbitrary code, sending the response back, and then if need be, executing the kernel function that was called. All right. Let us now see how each of these implementations compare with the other. ptrace needs extra transitions from kernel space to user space, while libc evokes entirely in user space and ebpf entirely in kernel space. Because of this, ptrace has a higher delay or latency, while libc and ebpf have a much lower latency or delay. Ptrace, the restriction on ptrace is that if you want to run ptrace, you, uh, the application calling ptrace should be run by the same user as the application you want to trace or should be run by the root user. In the case of libc, the shared library that you have created should be existing on the system and should have replaced the libc that, you are, that is dynamically loaded by the application that you are trying to trace. eBPF can only inject can only be injected in the kernel by a privileged application or user and uh, but once injected in the kernel any application and system call can be traced via it uh, you can also configure the linux kernel to allow unprivileged users to inject ebpf but from a security standpoint that's not a great idea normally uh, ptrace has an existing ecosystem of applications that already use it like strace gdb etc and eBPF has its ecosystem, including Falco and Celium. Celium is being used for network uh, eBPF, while Falco is being used for system calls. Libc, on the other hand, 
does not have any such open source or existing major ecosystem to do this. Although there are some startups that are trying to do this, but um, they are not open source at least yet. Let's consider a few frequently asked questions. If we want to override libc, which implementation should be targeted? There are a lot of implementations like glibc, musl, dat, libc, microsoft visual c runtime, which has its own libc implementation included. But majority Linux users defer to glibc and musl, and so these can be good targets. But as we previously mentioned, if you have statically compiled uh, libc, or if you have uh, let's say a go program with c go disabled and you have a pure go program then these won't work and tracing won't work with this what about dtrace dtrace itself which is available with bsd at least it uses bpf ebpf allows you to have bpf like programs which are written in that subset of c that was previously mentioned how about using application kernels for that we first need to know what are application kernels they are essentially kernel levels or rather system call functions that are provided in user space and do not really require kernel space. Uh, Google's Gvisor is a good example which tries to override um, the run C container runtime that Docker uses and instead use its own run SC container runtime uh, which provides quite a lot of system calls directly from the user space without actually making the system call. It's useful in some cases, but um, not very much in tracing because it introduces a much more bigger overhead. Other benefits of eBPF over ptrace. So um, this has been discussed before in the eBPF uh, section that this can be used to trigger Linux security modules and Linux security modules on the counterpart can be used to trigger eBPF. And so you can do efficient blocking of system calls also, not just tracing. So here are some extra links for further reading. We have Sysdig's blog on Sysdig's own Falco versus uh, Falco using Falco's driver versus eBPF versus dtrace and strace. strace being the one that uses ptrace. And how you can make a system call in C without using libc or any standard library. If your attacker knows that you are using a libc override, then they can just use this particular method um, to make system calls and your libc will not be able to trace it.